Riding up to camp on a farewell frog. You damned old piney mountain. I was 30 years of hanging on the old chain break. But he sing a sad old song. Got laid off and paid off in 58. Lord, in my time ain't long. Not a scared of God's soul to the scrap iron yard. Women, don't you weep for me. Virginia when the times got hard You damned old piney mountain And I lost my fingers to the steel band saw But he sing a sad old song Now my fiddle just hangs on tuned on the wall Lord, in my time ain't long Appalachia was basically settled by people from mostly Scotland, Ireland, England, some German. My great-great-grandfather was a stowaway on a boat from uh, Leeds, England. He actually wrote home, and I have all of the copies of the letters. The first one's talking about the great prosperity and potential here because he's, he described the trees, the virgin timber and the size of the trees. I can imagine how beautiful it was before it was touched by man. The southern Appalachian forest is what's called a mixed mesophytic forest. It is claimed to be the second most biodiverse forest in the world and the reason for that is when the glaciers came down there was sort of a certain degree of forest missing. All the forest in the world moved south. And then as the glaciers receded, the forest began moving back north. But some of the northern species moved a little bit slower than some of the southern species. So we still like down in this part of Appalachia, in the higher elevations, we have some of the species that can be found like up north in Canada. And then as you just kind of go further down in elevation, you get different bioregions of trees and it creates for a tremendous amount of biodiversity in this area. The immigration of, of other cultures came and when the coal was discovered here in the late 1800s and they couldn't get these hillbillies to cooperate and work like they wanted, they'd just bring in a new ethnic group right off the boat and ship them right down here to the coal country and uh, take the miners' jobs. But what often happened was uh, when the, the local miners would walk out, then a lot of times the immigrant miners would walk out as well and join them. Both my, my father and my grandfather were deep miners. That was the way that coal was extracted at that time up until the 70s. And they saw an opportunity to get coal faster with less labor, and that was called mountaintop removal. And I just wept when I saw what they had done to my mountains. They had basically been blowing them up, flattening them, and creating moonscapes. We know for a fact that the Appalachian counties in Virginia and throughout the central Appalachian region have greater negative impacts closer to mountaintop removal mines than in surrounding counties that account for the same kind of health variables of age and poverty and smoking, those kinds of things. Oh, most of the mines around here don't actually own the land. They lease the land from a land holding company, Penn, Virginia. So they will cut down all the trees before they apply for the permit. The reason for that being to when it comes time in the permit for talk about habitat, they've already destroyed the habitat because the trees have all been cut down. Mountaintop removal mining takes one sixth the labor force of deep mining. That's why they do it. It's more profitable. Um, but it employs less people, and so therefore it does not create jobs, it takes them. That's what I can't get people to understand, even when you confront them with the very facts of how many miners we used to have 20 years ago or 30 years ago before we were doing this type of mining versus now. The town of Appalachia, as I remember it growing up, was a boom town. 
Um, there were no places to park. Every business was open. People were buzzing around the streets. Everybody had a job. Um, it was great. Uh, today, it is almost a ghost town. The buildings are all boarded up. Very few businesses have survived. All of these counties down here in Virginia are the poorest in the whole state. Um, that's a fact. Most people don't speak out and they're afraid to speak out and for several different reasons. It may be because they have relatives or friends that work in the mining industry and they don't want to jeopardize their jobs. It may also be because they have a business and if word gets out that they're all of a sudden anti-coal, well, you might as well hang it up. You don't have a business if you're not a friend of coal around here. The people are becoming desperate here and they want someone to blame. So they want to blame President Obama and they want to say that Obama has a war on coal. It's all a myth created by the coal industry and they keep these people up in arms and misinformed. They, no one's talking about the, the truth, which is that coal is going away and that we have to find another way to survive. And that's the conversation we need to start having. When George Bush was in the White House, uh, one of the things that he did was change one word in a bill that was already in place called the Clean Water Act, and mountaintop removal became legal, and it became legal for them to bury streams with mine waste. The first year that I went to lobby on Capitol Hill, and we go every year to lobby for the Clean Water Protection Act, which would reverse the language that George Bush created in the Clean Water Act and reinstate the original law to protect our waterways. We visited with the EPA that year that Obama took office and one of the men in the meeting said, I want you people to know that we know what's going on. We know that mountaintop removal mining is killing people, destroying mountains, streams, and environments, but we have been powerless to do anything for the last eight years. He said, but there's a different feel on the hill, hill this year. We are we're presently in litigation and filing lawsuits over selenium discharges into streams without permits. Um, and there will be more. And one of those is against one of the big landholders here in this county. Our strategy, instead of bringing suit against the state, is to simply appeal to the federal agencies who oversee the state agencies to tell them they're not doing their job. They're not enforcing the law. And they're not looking out for people, they're just facilitating mining is all they're doing. Absolutely nothing has been done to bring employment into the area. In fact, one of their justifications for doing this type of mining is because they say we need land to develop Appalachia on. They need flat land down there. All they have is mountains. But the truth is that there has been so much, there are so many flatlands now throughout the central Appalachian mountains and only less than 5% of it has been developed. And all we get for development are things like Walmarts, prisons, and that's pretty much it it's third world. Wise County isn't booming economically to begin with to develop the land all in a commercial capacity. Appalachian Voice is another organization we work with did a study um, and they have it still available on their website that sh pretty much shows all the different places where they've reclaimed land and where they've supposedly reclaimed it to a more put it to a more beneficial use which is the clause they use to do some of this economic development and 90 percent of them were just supposed to be reclaimed as farms and they're just flat grassland there's n there's no economic development there reclamation around here consists of scraping out the roads and basically heaping the dirt up into a big mound and hydro seeding it with a non-native grass species and they walk away and they call that reclamation Drink and smoke, 
Bloody sing a sad old song. My hands can't fiddle and my heart's been broke. Lord, and my time ain't long. Across the ridge from Ice and Rock Ridge, the permit we're fighting is another mine called Looney Ridge. It is owned by A&G Coal Company. They were building an illegal haul road. So this haul road was not in their permit to begin with. And in the process of building that illegal haul road, they pushed a boulder over a hill and it rolled down the mountain through a little bit of buffer forest that they had placed between the road and the Inman community and crashed through a small trailer and killed a two-year-old child while it was sleeping. This area is a pandemic of prescription drug addiction. It's just filled with people who live in the, in, in the remains of what, what's left from their houses after blasting and coal trucks constantly spewing dust as they pass by. And most of those people up there that live in those areas are old people. They were retired coal miners or they're people that grew up there, moved away to work in factories and have moved back to retire. Those kinds of people, a lot of them you see that are raising their grandchildren and great-grandchildren because their own children and great and grandchildren are drug addicts. If they keep mining coal, it'll be so toxic here you won't be able to survive. If we stop mountaintop removal, someday it may heal, but it won't be in my lifetime or the next or the next or the next generation. It's going to take thousands of years for this earth to heal itself. It takes 100 years to form one inch of topsoil. So do the math. <laughs>